We are only two weeks away from the start of football season, so join me for the Hall of Fame game between the New York Jets and the Cleveland Browns, as we'll be live streaming the action then. More preseason streams to be announced soon. And now, on with our feature presentation. It's over. As of about 15 minutes ago, this is happening. The old Washington Commanders owner is now Daniel Snyder, and he presided over the team for 24 years. In that time, they won two playoff games. Oh, thank God the man's finally gone. It's about time. Our long national nightmare is over. Dan Snyder, the owner of the Washington Commanders for roughly the past quarter century, has officially sold the team for $6 billion, with Josh Harris being the new owner of the team. And let's be honest, Harris would have to murder about five people for us to even have the conversation about whether he's a worse owner than Snyder. Because you can make the legitimate argument that excluding owners who move the team, that Dan Snyder might be the worst owner in NFL history. He was terrible on the field, and he was terrible off the field. If I listed literally every single scandal that he was involved in, from his bizarre scandal in 2000 during a game against the Baltimore Ravens, which drew a lot of criticism from other owners, and which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, to all of his cover-ups and despicable treatment of women, to the laughably insulting retirement ceremony for Sean Taylor, I would be here all day. Seriously, Dan Snyder was an awful owner, an awful person, and the NFL is so much better off now that he is not an owner. But amidst all the controversies that we're reminiscing on, if that's even the right word, now that Dan Snyder is no longer a part of the NFL, I haven't heard anyone bring this one up from fairly early on in his ownership in 2002. In the grand scheme of things, was this controversy all that important? No. Did it hurt anyone or cause any harm? No. However, it was truly dumb and shows just how incompetent and out of place Snyder was as an NFL owner who had no idea what he was doing. Because in 2002, there was a bizarre controversy involving a player's jersey number that he just had to step in the middle of, and yet decided not to step in the middle of. He was hands-on and hands-off at the same time, if that even makes sense. And this indecision highlighted, once again, why Dan Snyder was such a terrible owner, even though on the scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being no controversy at all, and 10 being a controversy up there with the likes of his treatment of women, this one registers at about a 2 or a 3. Because this is the story, but I will let just be, considering the circumstances, the dumbest controversy in the career of the now former commander's owner Dan Snyder during his tenure as the team's owner. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, and what the player in our story wanted to try to do, we need some context to understand, well, who the player in question was, and why the team acquired him in the first place. After the 2001 season, Washington cleaned house following an 8-8 season, with the main problem being rather anemic play at the quarterback position, as you're seeing right here. Whether they were starting Tony Banks, or a past his prime Jeff George, they were struggling offensively. Out of 31 teams in football, Washington, despite being a halfway decent team running the ball, ranked 28th in total points and 28th in total yards. And looking at the play of their quarterbacks, it's not hard to see why. As a team, Washington was 28th in touchdown passes and actually finished the season with a touchdown to interception ratio of 1 to 1. 13 touchdown passes all season, and 13 picks. Now back in the 1960s, a touchdown to interception ratio that low was pretty good. But in the 2000s, it was dreadful. The team ranked second to last in passing yards as well, throwing for just 2,487 yards all season, or an average of 155 per game. The only team who did worse than them was the Dallas Cowboys. And when the only team you're better than from a passing standpoint was a team so bad 
that they had to start Quinn Sterner for multiple games and Ryan Lee for three, yeah, that's what you know. It was clear that when Washington hired Steve Spurrier to become their next head coach, that they needed to make a massive upgrade, and I truly mean a massive upgrade, at the quarterback position. Unfortunately, Steve Spurrier had a foolproof solution to the problem that couldn't possibly backfire in any way whatsoever. What if I just signed players who played for me at Florida? That's my Hail Mary attempt to improve the position. It'd almost be like if someone hired Jim Trussell as a head coach after he resigned from Ohio State, and his first move to improve the offense was to find out what Troy Smith was doing and have him start. It would almost be like if someone hired Urban Meyer as a head coach, and his first move was to sign him to- Oh, wait, that actually happened. God, I hate it here. Anyways, with that in mind, Spurrier made a trade with the Chicago Bears, where he would acquire the man that you've been watching this whole time. None other than Florida quarterback Shane Matthews. He also acquired former Florida quarterback Danny Warfel in a trade, just to give you an idea of how committed Spurrier was to the bit. Said Spurrier on why he got Warfel and Matthews, Why would I spend a lot of money on a quarterback? Check the quarterbacks I've been coaching the last 22 years. They generally played pretty good. All I know is what I've seen, and if you ask me about Danny Warfel and Shane Matthews, I'll say I was on the sidelines. You can check out all the yards and touchdowns and championships those guys won. I only won 7 SECs in 12 years, and those guys played on 6 of the teams. I could really do a whole documentary about the Steve Spurrier era in Washington, because he was laughably incompetent when it came to running a team and managing a roster, especially since he genuinely believed that Shane Freakin' Matthews was the answer to the quarterback position. Shane Matthews, as in a 32-year-old quarterback who was undrafted and had a career stat line in 15 starts of 19 touchdowns and 18 interceptions with a 75.1 passer rating, which was below the league-wide average by quite a bit, who's going to be the new starting quarterback. All right, it's crazy. We all know that. But now that Mad Dudes is in Washington, following seven seasons with the Chicago Bears, and two seasons bouncing around the Carolina Panthers in between, it was time for him to pick a jersey number to wear. What number would Matthews don in Washington? Well, it made logical sense for him that he would wear the number 9 jersey. It's the number he wore at Florida when he had his success there. It was the number that he wore throughout all of his seasons with the Chicago Bears. Shane Matthews and the number 9 jersey were synonymous with each other, almost like Tom Brady and the number 12 jersey, J.J. Watt and the number 99 jersey, and Sean Taylor and the number 21 jersey, which is so iconic that Washington retired it in a moving ceremony where they honor him with a lifelike statue where he's a mannequin. Good job there, Dan. Anyways, it looked like everything was to go for Matthews to wear the number 9 jersey, and to wear the number that he had worn throughout his entire career. Said Matthews on this decision, I don't think what a lot of people realize from the outside is that athletes get attached to numbers. And when you've been wearing that same number for 14 or 15 years, it's kind of hard to imagine wearing something else. People may think it's stupid, and it kind of is, but it isn't. Athletes are superstitious. However, there was just one small problem with Jay Matthews' plan. There was just one teeny tiny problem with the idea to wear the number 9 jersey. And that was the fact that in franchise history, the number 9 jersey was synonymous with this guy right here, the great Sonny Jurgensen. Now at the time, Washington never retired numbers. The only retired number in franchise history was Sammy Ball's number 33 jersey. However, there were certain players that were unofficially retired, almost like how Johnny Unitas was with the Baltimore Ravens, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Among the untouchable jerseys that weren't officially retired 
wore number 42 to Charlie Taylor, although that has since been officially retired. 44 to John Riggins, 49 to Bobby Mitchell, 81 to Art Monk, 7 to Joe Theismann, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, and of course, number 9 to Sonny Jurgensen, one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. When people talk about some of the greatest trade robberies of all time, this one has to be up there with the best of the bunch. Because Washington trading Norm Snead to Philadelphia for Sonny Jurgensen was one of the greatest moves they ever made. I would be here all day if I listed every single accolade that Jurgensen won in his career and every single thing that he accomplished, because trust me, it's a lot. But let's just say that he was really, really good, and there's a reason that he is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In 11 seasons with Washington, he had three seasons where he led the NFL in passing yards, including back-to-back -back years in 1966 and 1967. This isn't even including the two seasons that he did this in Philadelphia. He led the league in touchdown passes during the 1967 season when he threw 31, which was such an astronomically high number back then that it was the fifth most touchdown passes by any quarterback in a single season at the time. By the time he retired after the 1974 season, he had 255 touchdown passes, which ranked only behind Fran Tarkenton and Johnny Unitas for the most in pro football history. By the time he retired, he ranked fourth in league history in career passing yards, throwing for over 32,000 yards. Only Johnny Unitas, Franz Arkenton, and Y.E. Tittle were ahead of him in that category. And by the time he retired, he had five seasons where he led the NFL in passing yards. He became the first quarterback to ever lead the NFL in this category five times. And to this day, the only other guys to do it alongside Sonny are Dan Marino and Drew Brees. It is a very exclusive club. And if that wasn't enough, he was named to the All-1960s team, being named one of the top quarterbacks throughout the 1960s. And along with some AP nominations on the first and second team, he had multiple seasons where he received a vote for the MVP. Safe to say, Sonny Jurgensen was good. No one wore the number 9 jersey before him, and no one has won it since, as the number was unofficially retired. If I had to guess, we'll see an official retirement ceremony soon, seeing as there's no reason not to if he's literally the only player to wear it. He's a Hall of Famer, and he's going to be 89 years old in a few weeks as of this video. So time is running out for Jurgensen himself to witness the ceremony, which will be nice. And when Shane Matthews announced that he was going to wear the number 9 jersey, oh man, was there outrage over this. Matthews had no idea about the situation, which makes sense, because a lot of players do not know the history of the team that they play for. The number wasn't officially retired, and Jurgensen's prime was before Matthews was even born. And so, he contacted Washington about it and wondered what to do, especially since people like Hall of Famer Paul Horning of the Green Bay Packers were so insulted by this for some reason that they felt the need to chime in. Said Horning, Shane Matthews better throw a few hundred more touchdown passes before he ever thinks of wearing Sonny's jersey. Look, I can throw better than Matthews right now. Never did I think I'd see a feud between Shane Matthews and a 67-year-old Paul Horning, but here we were. So Washington had a dilemma on their hands. They had two options. Either let Matthews wear the unofficially retired jersey, or don't let him wear it and reserve it for the guy you've been watching, Sonny Jurgensen. Either way, you're going to upset someone, but you've got to make a decision. And shocker if you know anything about Dan Snyder, but he made what was, hands down, the worst decision of them all. And a decision that upset literally everyone. I don't know how something like this is even possible in an either-or situation where you can take off both parties simultaneously. 
but he found a way. Oh man, did he find a way. Because Snyder suggested to Matthews that he contact Jurgensen himself and see what his opinion on the issue was. If Jurgensen said that it was fine, then sure, it was fine, and Matthews could wear the number 9 jersey. It's not really a sign of disrespect, so much as it is wanting to pass on a great legacy with the number to the next generation. Plus, while some athletes care and don't want their number being touched, other athletes still care. And at the end of the day, for them, it's just a number, and they don't own it. Now on the surface, this seems like the smart thing to do, right? Have Matthews ask Jurgensen for permission, and have Jurgensen make the call. As for what Jurgensen said, he said that it was totally fine. Jurgensen did warn Matthews about the decision and said, you're going to be opening up a can of worms with some people in Washington. But he fully gave Matthews permission to wear the number, no problem. It's almost like if you're a parent and your kid asks you if he can play outside at the park for another hour with his friends because they really want to get another kickball match in. And you say, yeah, but just be careful, it's getting late. Permission with a caveat in terms of knowing what you're getting into. But Jurgensen made the call and said that he was okay with it. And then, after Dan Snyder said that, after Dan Snyder had Matthews call up Jurgensen to see what his thoughts were, and after Dan Snyder said that it was up to Jurgensen to make the final call, Snyder overruled him. That's right. This man right here, Sonny Jurgensen, he was going to be the only one wearing the number 9 jersey, even though it wasn't retired. And this wasn't some random team official that made the call, and Snyder had no idea about this controversy. No, according to sources, Snyder was the one who made the call on this. Basically, Snyder ran a poll with the interested parties, was unhappy with the results of the poll, and then said, screw what you guys think, we're doing it this way. How absurd is that? Imagine if you're debating what to do for dinner for a family vacation in New York City. Go to a local place, or go to the Olive Garden in Times Square. You say, we'll put it to a vote. I have no preference. It's up to what you guys want. Everyone in the family says, let's go to the local place. And then you say, well, too bad. We're going to Olive Garden because I'm the one in charge and I make the final call. Good job there. Way to show off your strong parenting and leadership skills. Again, if Snyder said outright, we're not going to have Matthews wear the number nine jersey, then yes, people would be upset and would be questioning it. Especially since the number was retired, but fine. If Snyder said Matthews, you can wear the number 9 jersey, then yes, people would be upset and wondering how you can give Shane freaking Matthews the jersey number of this legend, but fine. If Snyder said at the end of the day, it's Sonny Jurgensen's number, and he gets to make the call on this, and we'll go with whatever he wants, as it's the case with a lot of players when their number is out of circulation, and a player asks for permission to wear it, then fine. But Snyder took, quite literally, the worst approach possible, and blew this controversy up to 11 when it did not need to get to that point. He made the retire the number people mad by allowing Matthews the thought of wearing the number. He made the let Matthews wear the number people mad by not giving Matthews the number. He made Sonny Jurgensen mad for going against him, even though Jurgensen was the one that supposedly had the final authority. He made Shane Matthews mad because he believed he could wear the number he's been wearing all his life, gave him the stipulation to do it under, had him comply with that stipulation, and then stripped it away from him. He literally managed to tick off every single party, no matter what side you were on, about a jersey number. That takes skill. That seriously takes skill. It's like if the president signs an executive order saying that we're going to spend $100 trillion this year to try and establish a colony on Jupiter. And both parties, 
no matter what side of the aisle you're on, or what side the president is on, say, what the heck are you doing? That's the worst idea ever. You're so not fit to be doing this. How in the heck did you arrive at that decision? You get the idea. Everyone was upset. And for what it's worth, not only did Matthews wear the number six jersey, since it was an upside down number nine, but no one has since worn this jersey, number nine, from Sonny Jurgensen, as he is still, all these years later, even though he retired nearly half a century ago, the only player to don that jersey. Again, in the grand scheme of things, is this the most important or significant controversy, or the most serious issue that Dan Snyder ever dealt with as Washington's owner? Absolutely not. Is this the controversy that people are going to remember him for, instead of his withholding of funds from the NFL, the name change, and his treatment of women in the workplace? No. But perhaps no controversy shows just how bad of an owner Snyder was than this one right here. Because he somehow ticked off everyone with a binary yes or no decision, which again, should not be possible. His wavering and indecisiveness on the number 9 jersey issue is just one of the thousands of examples that show why Dan Snyder was not fit whatsoever to successfully run a team. At least he got $6 billion out of it. And if this example is any indication, I promise you, to the new owners of the Washington Commanders, you cannot do worse. You literally cannot do worse. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.